Well, the Lal Street ended Friday and the week with losses. The Sensex and the Nifty lost a percent each for the week, with IT stocks falling the most on Friday. But how are equities poised for 2023? Will China become the tactical play for the next year? And what are the implications of falling crude oil prices? We discuss all this and more on this week's edition of the Editor's Roundtable starting now. I'm Sonia Shanoi and with me, I have the editors with me. There's a special guest as well. So, folks, thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, you know, it was a week when I think the final nail on the coffin was on Friday when the IT stocks got hit very hard after HCL Tech mid-quarter said, you know what, we may not meet our guidance in entirety. They lowered it. And that was a sour point. But all in all, not such a bad week for equities, you'd uh, have not, to say. Not such a bad. I thought you were going to start with FIFA, though. You know? <laughs> 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 That's, uh, That's for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, all of us are Nigel. Where are you going with? <laughs> I'm going. By the way, it's interesting. Where you know people say, "Let's go. Let's watch the match together." Where are you going? Which pub? Which bar? I'm going to my kids' school. Oh, lovely. <laughs> because they, they are, they are, Amish is with us as well. Amish, of course, is head of research at Bank of America. Uh, I'm going to my kids' uh, school. They're having an airing, oh, not nice. the late one, but the 8:30 yeah. one. So okay. I'm there. Exciting I'm sure, plan. Uh, do you have a view on uh, before the markets? <laughs> what about the FIFA? I mean, are you tracking it? Are you backing that, it? That's the most difficult one to predict. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but usually you around. I remember the last FIFA World Cup. There was all this analysis done about yeah. what happens to markets when right. you know the country which is hosting it or the octopus after, as well. Yeah. The octopus. The octopus right? Oh, yeah. absolutely! <laughs> that octopus used to always get it right. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Amish, I mean, since you're here with us, uh, thank you for joining us in the studio. How are you feeling? It's the end of 2022. I can't believe this year has just flown by. How are you feeling about the markets? So, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, as far as next year goes, I think we are in for, again, a volatile market. Uh, as investors start to debate the outlook for global macro next year, I think we'll see Nifty go to 17,000 on one side. Yeah. We'll also see Nifty go to 20,000 on the other side. Our bias is that by the end of the year, uh, you know, markets will be more on the top end of that range, mm. uh, which basically means that we are we are looking at mid to high single digit returns. Uh, and as a result, India could continue to outperform the developed markets, uh, but we will underperform the emerging markets next year. Okay. Uh, in, in order to maximize alpha or returns, I think one will have to be nimble. Mm. Uh, more importantly, two strategies will work. One is to keep buying the dips, and we can discuss why we think buying the dips will make sense next year and the other is to be uh, is to rotate within sectors mm. that have near term triggers or near term themes mm. i mean so more of a not a traders market but you're going to be more nimble as you said absolutely uh, you know so trader yeah. uh, i would say that you know you will have those themes play out for 6 to 9 months yeah. uh, you know so if you time those well uh, those are the pockets of generating alpha next year. And we'll come back to each of these uh, specifically in a bit from now. Let's, let me just pull back a little bit. You gave us the whole range for the next year. But how is the very near term uh, set up, right? So we've been talking about this 20-day moving average mm. for the Nifty. And I think on Friday, the market did break that. Uh, and we actually went to almost 18,400 and 400. But by close, the market came back to closer to 18,500. We ended above that. And we are exactly at the 20-day moving average. I mean, it's a near-term level, but it's watched widely, watched very closely. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's the big one as we he head into next week. As I think Amish also pointed out, recent history suggests that buying the dip has worked. So, uh, more often than not, that has worked. So, is there any big overwhelming reason to change that? Perhaps no, not at this uh, point in time. I would look at uh, client positioning, but this is as of Friday, Thursday's uh, data because we don't have Friday's numbers. Both FI and client positioning is very, very low. I mean, you know, the long positions are very low. Uh, so you can kind of look at it both ways. You can say it's, it's a good thing. They're not at extreme levels earlier. But you can also say that are they now going to go short? Uh, so that's the other way to look at this. Banks still, I think, uh, hold the key to the market. They're the strongest part of the market. PSU banks, though, all pulled back. Bank of India, on fr today, on Friday, that is. And by the way, they did that with some of the highest volumes since February of 2021. You know, markets have rallied, the PSU banks have rallied so much, and then a reversal, which is to the tune of 7 8% in many of these stocks, on very high volumes. I mean, I think you, you need to be watchful there, uh, whether it indicates a bit of a, a trend and a change in trend. IT see the big uh, sell-off, and I think the uh, voices around this slowdown recession in the US are only growing louder. Oil prices, I think it's a big macro positive, but it's, is it all positive? I think that's the question, uh, because history suggests that when oil comes off, it also indicates a bit of a risk off. Uh, you know, it's, it's deflationary. It's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't uh, stoke risk appetite in that sense. And next week, of course, in terms of a global push, 
Uh, you got the CPI, the consumer price index number, and uh, it's followed the next day uh, with the US FOMC decision. So it's, uh, I mean, we'll, there's lots to track for, in terms of a global trigger as well. But the 20-day moving average, I think that's the, you know, we're not the Lakshman Rekha, maybe some, some other Rekha, but it's an important <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, Nimesh, uh, dealing room check. You, you got so, the pulse. Prashant, you know, uh, again, to me, it looks like there's a week of consolidation. No panic as such, yeah. if, whether you call the FI flows or for that matter, the retail participation, there seems to be there. Turning a bit selective, but again, you know, that, that's the participation is there. So I wouldn't call it as a panic panic, so to speak. And I guess the Nifty is struggling to go about that 18,900 level. That's a crucial level for, for a big breakout from those levels. So I think that's something to watch out for in the, in the very immediate term. On the downside, maybe 18,300 is acting as a very strong support. So that's yeah. where the Nifty could find a support there. I guess the big sector of the week uh, and has been the trend for the last many, many weeks has been the PSU banks. And now we are seeing, you know, uh, upgrades pouring in. We saw Morgan Stanley upgrading the multiples and, and target prices of most of the PSU bank stocks towards the weekend. We saw even Credit Suisse raising Bank of India to outperform and they've raised a target price on PSU banks. But now the big question is they all are inching towards the one-time price to book on FY22. And normally we've seen some bit of profit booking or underperformance around those levels. So the big question is, is the big rally in PSU banks over? I don't think it's it's over yet. No, I mean, it's a, it's a tough to call or give a judgment, but that's something which people have been talking about. I think that in terms of liquidity, the trend of the P's exiting, the promoter selling stake, that seems to be continuing. We saw a couple of large block deals this week as well. I believe even next week, though it's a, going to be light in terms of volumes for the next three weeks, but there are a few uh, you know, blocks lined up. So that's something, uh, you know, that trend continues. I guess on the macro, the big positive uh, for India is the call of, for falling crude prices. And, and that's why, you know, you're seeing uh, the, the biggest proxy to macro, the, the banks, and they've done well. For the last few days, even in terms of flows, the banks is where you're seeing a bit of flows as well. So that's the setup for the next week. The banks are expected to do well. No panic selling, so to speak. But I guess Nifty is struggling to go beyond that 18,900 levels. And that's something to watch out for. Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, that's about the local markets, yeah. right? But, uh, Nigel, uh, you know, the big, of course, positive headline is mm. that China has opened up, opposed its zero COVID policy, I think, for so three or four years. It's removed all its curbs. But that's the big question. Is it a threat to Indian equities in 2023? And you've done some research on well, that. Well, uh, you know, guys, since it's a weekend, uh, you know, India seems to be all heart. Yeah. But maybe, in fact, you know, market wants to have a bit of a fling with the Chinese market. So that, on that note, you know, let me drive this point forward. And most experts that jo join on the channel, well, they have been suggesting one thing. India is the preferred investment uh, your destination. However, in the near term, China could possibly be a tactical player. So let's take that point forward uh, then. China, remember, they have been talking about exiting the zero COVID policy. So more rational China, could it be a bit of a risk for the Indian market? Well, higher metal prices is something that the street is debating on, and it could have its impact on metal stocks. The bigger question is higher input costs, could it impact earnings? That could be a bit of a risk. We'll have to see how that combination plays out. Next up, this year, 2022 has belonged to India. We have seen solid returns in terms of the Indian markets. However, the last one month or so, well, China has been outperforming. So, you know, that that uh, throws some bit of caution that maybe some kind of money is moving to China. And I was looking at the flows. There's a McQuarrie note that's come out. And, you know, they have given the flow picture of China. And China has seen good amount of inflows in the month of uh, November. To be fair, emerging markets on the whole, they have seen a good amount of inflows. India included even ex-China emerging markets, we have seen a good amount of inflows. But China, well, in the month of November, after a few months, you saw strong inflows out there. Keep in mind that, you know, the globe basically has gone underweight China. Or the weightage, you know, even if you look at the MSCI emerging markets, it's come down substantially from around that 43%. It's come down closer to around 30%. And India, remember, has been a beneficiary because our weightage has nearly doubled. Finally, valuation-wise, India is expensive, right? I mean, in relative terms, or if you compare it with the other markets or historical data, well, we are trading at closer on 20, 21, 22 times odd. China's available at around 10 and a half times odd. So, Valuation-wise, China has some cushion. The big question is, will that tactical switch take place and will it be a bit of a risk for the Indian equities in 2023? Well, we'll find out soon. All right, Nigel, thanks very much uh, for that. I mean, what, 11 times, 20, the, the old, uh, the China, Sasta Mal. And Sasta. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's, I'm not, uh, you know, the, the point about China is interesting because I read an article, I think it was in Atlantic or it was in New Yorker, which said the vaccine in China is actually, uh, compared to the other MNRI vaccines, etc., or even what we've used here, is very subpar. Mm. Uh, the f efficacy is very low. So is China's hand also being forced because of all these protests and 
what that means is if you know casualties start to grow covid related deaths start to move up will this be a non stop reopening process or will this have stop starts etc yeah. amish but you know uh, for the purpose of this discussion the as nigel pointed out do is does it hurt or does it help no, do you think the world wants to have a fling with china <laughs> you, can, you can answer that in those terms, fling or love affair. So, uh, surely, you know, uh, for next year, we think China will do well, uh, even if it is tactically. Uh, mm. The market, you, as you rightly pointed out, is really cheap. Uh, economy is opening up after a long time. People would want to travel. Discretionary spends will pick up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so China will do well. But the big question that uh, investors keep asking me all the time is that China re recovery from a market's perspective does it come at the cost of india mm. and mm. that i think is a is a big no okay uh, you know historically if you plot the data uh, we have seen that the uh, the direction of the flows for india and china is unidirectional uh, you know in other words if china gets flows india gets flows as well right uh, and the reason for this is quite simple over 90 plus percent of the funds that invest mm. in india are actually non india dedicated funds mm. uh, you know so these is em pool of money almost One, 95% or yeah. something absolutely so yeah. if if money does get allocated to the emerging markets you can under allocate to india but it is not going it is very unlikely that it is going to be negative flows for india okay. uh, so so you know the positive china story is actually a positive FI inflow story for, for India. For India okay. as well. And so to be fair, even the month of November, actually, the flows into India, they were good. Absolutely. You know, China, it was a little bit better in, in comparison to what we saw in the previous months. But for India, as you, as you said, yes. The, Absolutely. The so, Nigel, that validates the argument that yes. if you look at the whole of this calendar year, uh, you know, India, one could argue, was doing very well economically. Mm. But because China okay. saw outflows, India okay. saw outflows as well. Mm. November, China saw inflows, India, India. saw inflows as well. Mm. Uh, you know, it just goes. But as a margin, together. we were talking about because it's been such an extreme situation. It's not been, not been, not been normal, right? With the lockdown, etc. Uh, at the margin, people have been saying, do we will we start the emer see the emergence of India dedicated money? You know, emerging market funds ex China. I mean, those kind of conversations were starting to come about. So at the margin, maybe it does. Uh, it does uh, that momentum maybe uh, pulls back a little bit, right? Absolutely, Prashant. So don't disagree with that. But that pool of money is very it's small. It's very small. It'll take a long so, time to grow. Absolutely. So it, it is it is catching up as a theme, but I think it'll it, it is not meaningful at this point in time. Okay, I do have a few more questions for you. But in the interim, let's also get Nimesh, uh, you know, to tell us about how global equities are expected to shape up in 2023. Nimesh, over to you. So, Sonia, you know, uh, we are just three weeks away from entering into 23, and you know that the big question in the mind of investors is how the 23 is going to look like. So I've just looked at. Uh, almost 300 pages of brokerage reports across some 15, 18 brokerages. And I've looked at the data for both global and for the Indian markets. Now, look first look at the global data and what the global themes looks like. Uh, as far as the big themes are concerned, there are the four, three, four big themes that globally one has to look out for. The recession theme, the inflation theme, uh, Fed pivot, and the China reopening. These are going to be the big four themes as far as globals are concerned. Uh, the, some big reports have come out from influential brokerages. So what is Credit Suisse saying? Credit Suisse saying, that 2023 is going to be tale of two halves. The first half, the focus is going to be on higher rates for longer theme, which means that the muted, which means the equity performance will be muted. But uh, in the second half, as central banks pivot, uh, they are expecting investors to rotate to high interest sensitive sectors uh, with a growth tail. So that's the view from Credit Suisse. Uh, look at uh, what Fidelity has to say. Fidelity believes that cyclical recession is the most likely outcome uh, in 2023, which, which means that they remain cautious on the global equities. However, they are very bullish on ASEAN and Indian markets. So that's a big bullish view from Fidelity on India. Uh, I've put out some number as well. Morgan Sale has put out the numbers for 2023. They have an S&P target of 3,900. They have a, a DYX of 104. And they've put out a Brent target of 110. That's the number which Morgan Sale has put out for 23. But what this all means for the Indian markets. Now, for India markets, I've put out four big themes. The first big theme is the big India outperformance. 23 was a, 22 was a big year of India outperformance, so we need to see whether that can continue. We are sitting on very peak valuations, and the, and the sentiment is quite bullish as well at the retail end, so that could be a bit of a negative for India. The waning commodity inflation, that's the only positive thing which can play out for India in 23, and the retail flows, which have been a big backbone for India, that is something to track in 23 as well. What are the brokerages saying? So, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs has put out a, a target of 20,500 for end of December 23, but they believe that India is likely to, uh, unlikely to outperform for third year in a row as China and other uh, you know, cyclical markets like North America opens up and they may do better. So that's the, that's the view from Goldman Sachs. Uh, they are, uh, in terms of sectors, they're overweight on sectors like banks, uh, insurance, industrial, cement and utilities. 
whereas they are underweight on names like IT, uh, NB, uh, NBFCs, consumer durables, and retail sector. So that's the Goldman Sachs view. Look at Morgan Stanley. They've put, even they believe that uh, you know they have a target of the Sensex target of 68,500. But even they believe that India's relative gain may be may take a breather in 2020. So that's summing up as a big uh, you know theme for India as well in terms of their sector overweight. They are overweight on financials, technology consumer discretionary, but they're underweight on most of the other sectors. Uh, in fact, we have uh, Amish with us, but even, even, even I was looking at the uh, buffer securities note, and they, they have a target of 19,500. And, and what Amish po pointed out, it could be a very volatile market for us, with a range between 17,000 to 20,000. And within sectors, they're overweight on financials, industrials, staples, and utilities, whereas they're underweight on IT, discretionary, autos, telecom, and pharma. So the big theme is India can see a bit of a breather in the first half of 2023. Okay, Nimesh, thanks for that. And what I noticed is that a common thread is most of these large brokerages or fund houses are all underweight on the IT sector. Amisha, I wanted your thoughts here because, you know, this week was important, right? I mean, HCL Tech mid-quarter has come out and said we won't meet our guidance. This is after raising their guidance last quarter in Q2. Uh, so do you think there's incremental weakness despite the 20-30% falls that these stocks have seen? Sonia, the short answer is yes. Uh, and if you look at it over the last 15 years, we have seen three such episodes. One during the global financial crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis, and the digital disruption. Every time there is a global cyclical issue or a global economical, uh, economic cycle tapers off, we've always seen IT re constant currency revenue growth come off. Mm -hmm. uh, and this time around, uh, unfortunately, the valuations for the sector are quite high too. Uh, and as a result, we think uh, the revenue growth guidance will keep getting curtailed and the stocks will come off. Amish, what stood out for me within your you know, sector weights is metals. You're overweight on metals. It's a bit of a non consensus view, so to speak. Uh, why you're bullish on metals and which metals you think will do well in 2023? So first of all, we are very bullish on the CAPEX cycle. Okay. Uh, if you believe that, uh, I think domestic demand for metals will pick up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, obviously, China reopening helps as well. Uh, so on the back of these two things, we think uh, both steel and uh, non-ferrous will do well. Non-ferrous, we were always bullish, but we have recently upgraded steel too. Okay. okay. In fact, we want to take that discussion forward since we're talking commodities. A big fall in crude was also the headline of last week. So we'll slip into a short break. Don't go anywhere. We will return. We'll also talk about the events that the market can look forward to next week. So do stay tuned in. Welcome back to Editor's Roundtable on CNBC TV 18. The big headline of last week, apart from all that we discussed before the break, is the falling crude prices. And it is, of course, positive for a whole host of sectors. In case you missed it, crude prices are now down $20 per barrel in the last one month. And this is the lowest that we've seen since December of 2021. Of course, several factors resulting in the fall in crude. One is the weak demand in China. The PMI in China is now at a seven-month low. There's the uncertainty as far as the Fed Reserve is concerned. Most uh, more rate hikes expected and there's the EU price cap on Russian oil as well. Now two sectors that I'm looking at, one of course is oil marketing companies, it's positive for them. Um, City put out a note where they said that HPCL's earnings will see the most positive swing. In fact, HPCL's quarterly EPS should rise from 15 rupees per share in Q2 to 18 rupees per share. BPCL's quarterly EPS should rise to 16 rupees as well and IOC's EPS should rise to 5 rupees a share. It's also positive for sectors like tyres and aviation. Particularly for tyres, both rubber and crude prices have fallen. Crude derivatives are used in the manufacture of nylon tyre cord fabric, which is used to make tyres. So it's expected to be a positive for names like Apollo tyres. In fact, Apollo tyres itself said that raw material basket is expected to decrease by 3% quarter on quarter in this particular, uh, you know, in the quarter that's to come. So Amish, I wanted your thoughts on this. There is, of course, on one hand, the demand outlook, which is improving for sectors like tyres. But apart Apart from that, this raw material tailwind, um, which are the pockets that you think could be the big beneficiaries of the fall in crude? So crude, uh, you know, as much as you would not expect, actually finds its way through freight, uh, which is very relevant for cement stocks, in fact. Uh, it is also relevant for staples. Uh, you know, a large percentage of their cost is actually freight cost. Uh, we are actually uh, just turning or taking a sag way. I think cement as a sector uh, is not only just seeing the benefit of the crude coming off, but also pet coke, coal prices, and I think these prices will keep coming down as we go along. Uh, plus, the demand outlook is improving. So I would be probably bullish cement and staples on the back of that. Okay, all right. Uh, Amish, I wanted to ask you about your call on autos. 
Uh, you just mentioned that you guys are going overweight on, uh, or you're like, changing your stance on the Ferris space. I remember middle of this year, you said, you know, you're like, bullish or you're like, quite constructive on the two-wheeler and four-wheeler space selectively. What's your stance now? If input costs are going to go up, best of the autos have played out? Uh, I would agree, Nigel. Uh, you know, I think most of the positives around auto as a sector, uh, whether you call about, whether you talk about new product cycle, uh, the new product launches, or commodity benefits, margin gains, all of that now I think is priced in. Okay. Incrementally, one could argue that the risk are more towards earnings downgrades. As commodity prices pick up, uh, cost of cars uh, are going up on the back of regulations, on the back of price hikes. Uh, that could have, an, uh, could have an impact on the volume growth as well. Hmm. Uh, minus uh, some auto stocks where the beneficiaries could be on the back of rural recovery, yeah. uh, which we think could come through. Uh, we are by and large now uh, in the underweight camp for autos. Amish, uh, one, this is a larger, not a sector specific question, but two, through this year, 2022, the one big uh, constant has been retail flows, which have been so strong, right? It's kind of helped us tight through everything. Yeah. Uh, ba bad news, worse news, everything, and the markets have come out on top. Do you think that will remain this way going forward as well? Because, I mean, I know it's imponderable right now, but interest rates are rising. Uh, maybe they're getting a little competitive as compared to uh, expected future equity returns. Your thoughts? So I would divide uh, the flows uh, for domestics into two parts. Mm -hmm. One is the passive flows and the other is the active flows. Mm -hmm. On the passive side, I think if you just look at uh, EPFOs, National Pension Scheme, uh, you know, insurance, SIPs, etc. I think that alone on a conservative basis, uh, you know, domestic funds could probably get $20 billion of inflows next year. Uh, the other argument is on the active flows, where on the back of fixed deposit rates going up, uh, etc. I yes, there is a reason to believe that those flows may stem. Uh, but Prashant, at the same time, I would I would also argue that the run rate of FII outflows I think will also come down. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of uh, that, uh, 20 billion dollars will be a sufficient number uh, to keep the market. Uh, 20 insulated. billion from retail or net of everything? 20, 20, 20 plus. 20 billion dollars only from passive. From passive. Uh, we don't know what happens to active, but okay. there's a reason to believe that the active may get diverted towards bank deposits. Okay, well, we have run out of time, but not out of questions. Amish, thanks a lot for joining in and speaking to CNBC TV 18. Well, that brings us to the end of another week, but a big weekend up ahead, guys. A big FIFA weekend. So everyone fact, have a great today time. Today is a Brazil match at yeah. 8.30. Brazil goes through, Netherlands goes through, uh, France goes through, and which is the other game? Morocco. I don't know. I, the, the second the one tomorrow, underdogs. right? I, I don't know. I mean, the second one today is Netherlands. Netherlands. The first one is Brazil. Brazil. And Portugal. 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 You're going with Portugal, Sonia? <laughs> I, Brazil, I guess. Most of us, right? Going with Brazil this time around. But let's see. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot, Amish, once thanks again for, for joining me. us in the studio. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Editor's Roundtable. Don't go anywhere. More news and updates continue on the other side.